Yeah, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Alexander, for this kind introduction. So, um, and I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this data here. I think it's a great forum, so it's a great conference. And um, so this is the title of my talk. I will present you some data coming from a sequencing project that we started in 2010, and I will mainly focus on two big publications uh, that came out of this. And so um, I will start with a quite boring slide to give you some numbers. So this um, is the sequencing cohort I'm talking about. This, um, as I said, started in 2010 as a, a German-Belgian initiative. We had some um, genome sequencing in there and more than 200 exomes, some targeted sequencing um, data panels and uh, some RNA sequencing um, data of 500, around about 500 patients. So, and these were all diagnostic samples. And uh, this means that all the data I'm showing you today is coming from the initial diagnostic biopsy. So you can already see all this data at the time point of diagnosis and not during the time course, but this is uh, detectable very early in the clinic. So we also, uh, added some relapse data just because we were curious and these were done by a, a commercial sequencing panel and we included 63 patients. So this is the overview and the first really astonishing result that we saw came from our bioinformatics guy because um, back then uh, nobody really knew how to analyze these sequencing panel uh, um, sequencing uh, profile, so, and he had some other panels um, from other data sets coming from the Broad Institute, for example, or his own lung cancer uh, data sets, and he said, do you know, uh, you know, um, when I look at your data, I see some peculiarities that I don't see in the other data sets, so um, this is maybe not an artifact, and this looks like this is not coming from the uh, from a technical problem or something. We see some some strange, uh, yeah, breakpoints on chromosome five, and as you can see on the left hand side, these were breakpoints in the region of the third gene, and so we validated this data, and what we found out and what we published in 2015 was that the third locus is rearranged in these patients. So um, this means that uh, you can see a break apart fish here. We also validated this with a fish analysis. And we made so two probes, one red one and one green one. This is for the third gene and this is for the neighboring gene. And you can see with the uh, uh, white arrowheads that if the locus is wild type, you can see these two genes sitting together, but the yellow uh, arrow points at a, an extra copy of TERD, so this is sitting there alone. And uh, this means that if the neighboring gene is not there, there's a break point, so you have a rearrangement, which means um, that there is an uh, open chromatin because usually the third locus is um, folding back itself, so it's inhibited because of uh, um, uh, the DNA structure. And if you just remove this part, then it is an open chromatin locus. And also what we saw here, I didn't show it, but um, sometimes enhancer elements are transferred here. You have rearrangements just enhancing the expression of the third uh, locus. So this is the active complement of the telomerase um, complex. So and this is what we saw in a large proportion of high-risk patients. And this is why we then um, published this first model, where we proposed that um, telomere maintenance mechanisms are active in high-risk tumors. And this doesn't only mean telomerase activation, but also alternative lengthening of um, telomeres, which I will come to back uh, uh, later. So, and... Um, the second uh, point was that this activation of the telomerase uh, shows to be uh, significant in high-risk patients, but also means that we have the most aggressive subtype of the tumors uh, when telomerase is active. And what was even more important, um, if we don't see telomer, uh, telomere maintenance, um, 
then this means that we have low-risk tumors. We don't see this uh, mechanism in low-risk tumors. So and then we thought maybe this has something to do with tumor regression. And um, on top of this, um, we still had these big data sets um, and we also checked for other mutations and for um, mutation networks and what actually, um, yeah, um, is this moving? No, not really. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, and um, what came out in the meantime, while we were looking at all these networks that were looking like hairballs, was that some analysis with relapsed neuroblastoma showed an enrichment of mutations in the MAP kinase pathway. So, all the common suspects like activated RAS, ALK, all the oncogenes that everybody has been looking at for ages, I would say. So, I was pretty disappointed because we were actually we were searching for the neuroblastoma gene, but we went back to RAS and um, we also thought maybe this is a quite low hanging fruit. We could, we could just take a quick look. And so we also analyzed um, uh, 63 relapse samples with a commercial panel, which included those genes and we could confirm the data. So we saw that these RAS pathway mutations were clearly enriched in those samples, but also we found enrichment of P53 pathways. So this was not only confirming the data, but adding one more pathway. So this is not dramatically recurrent, but we still thought we should add this pathway. Some other pathways were affected as well, but these were singletons and we didn't really focus on that. So we decided to define a set of 17 genes from these two pathways. And since this was relapse data, check these genes in the initial data. And this is what came out. This is just a quick summary. You all know these pathways. And we saw that single genes are not really affected, but the pathways are recurrently affected. And um, what I really have to point out, it is really important if you check for those mutations, it is important that um, you also look at copy numbers. Some people publish data not uh, just only looking at uh, mutations, and some others publish data just looking at copy numbers. And it's only a strong marker if you combine this, because copy number changes make up about one quarter. So, um, I mean, um, we have, uh, sometimes we have quite low numbers in the cohorts of neuroblastoma, and this is really relevant, um, and it's really um, difficult uh, for statistics if you don't include 25% of the mutations. So, um, then we thought, um, if this is recurrently uh, detected, maybe this is important for survival of the patients. And this is what it looks like for the entire cohort. So the red curve means we found mutations in the initial tumors. And, um, but this looked like maybe it's just a high-risk group. And then we extracted and looked only at the high-risk group. And actually, it wasn't just the high-risk group. It was, uh, again, red is mutations, blue is new mut no mutations. So there seemed to be a difference between um, tumors carrying those mutations and um, those in which we didn't find them. But it wasn't McN. This was the next idea. Maybe the red curve is just the McN amplified patients, but it isn't. And so uh, you can see here in dark red, these are McN amplified, but also in light red, these are the McN non-amplified patients. So in these tumors, we found the mutations and uh, survival, this is overall survival, is equally poor as in the McN amplified patients. But what was even more astonishing, we found a subgroup in the non-high risk group um, which had a slightly worse outcome. So, um, and coming from this um, plot, we thought, what is the difference between those patients that die and those patients that don't die here? And um, so, from this point, um, yeah, that's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, so, as you can see here, the numbers are quite low. As I said, um, we only had 23 patients in the red curve. So, we thought these are non-high-risk patients. 
where, uh, in which, uh, in, in, in whose tumors we found those mutations. Maybe we should increase the number of uh, the patients in this cohort to get a better uh, insight of what is happening here. So that's what we did. And um, <clears throat> from this analysis, we thought maybe this has something to do with our first paper with the telomere maintenance analysis. And so we had a look at non-high risk patients, um, tumors with mutations, and um, we did some telomere maintenance analysis, which means in our case, we check MIGN amplification first and then add three analysis. So check for TERD rearrangements, as I showed you in the first slides, checked for high TERD expression and also non-telomerase dependent mechanism, alternative lengthening of telomeres. And these, uh, yeah, this is the plot that I just showed you, just um, again, these were the first 23 patients and then we added some patients and added telomere maintenance analysis and you can clearly see that this is the solution for the problem that we have here. This is the red curve split up into two groups. So um, they all carry mutations in one of these 17 genes, but the blue curve means no telomere maintenance, and the red curve means telomere maintenance. And just as a reminder, these are non-high-risk patients, and they have a very poor outcome, so we really think they are in the wrong risk group. And this is quite a large number. I mean, um, we thought this is just non-high-risk, but maybe this is also important for the total cohort. So. Um, I can first show you some pictures from the clinic to <laughs> illustrate what I mean. These are highly activating mutations in ALK, and um, these patients didn't receive any therapy. I mean, you have stage two, three, four, and all these tumors show regression, and um, which is uh, what is even more astonishing when we looked at uh, this is just a small oncoplot. When we looked at 12, uh, 11 patients with the identical ALK mutations, all non-high-risk patients, we saw that um, on the left-hand side in red, patients with telomere maintenance had very poor outcome, but on the right-hand side, uh, patients without telomere maintenance had very good outcome. And we even saw spontaneous regression only just in this subgroup. So. As I said, we thought maybe this is not only important for the non-high risk group, but also for the main cohort. So uh, this is a very busy slide. You don't have to read all the lines. I will just uh, go on and make it look a little more easy. Because on the left-hand side, you just have the red group with telomere maintenance, positive tumors. On the right-hand side, in blue, you have telomere maintenance negative. Um, uh, tumors. And this is the survival of those patients that were non-high risk. So this blue line is all these uh, 17 patients here that were classified non as non-high risk before. And just just as a reminder, 17 percent, uh, this is 15 percent of all of the non-high risk patients. So we really think we have uh, an error of 15 percent in the uh, initial classification. So uh, they should be in the high risk group because no matter whether they were classified as high risk or non-high risk before, they were uh, they had very poor survival. So survival is equally poor as the high risk patients. So, and if you then take a look at the mutations, this is completely different from what I had learned at university because they had told us if you find activated RAS, loss of NF1, all these common subspaces, some activated kinases, amplifications, whatever, you get aggressive tumor growth. And actually you don't because, mm, as we just show here, it's not sufficient to have an activated oncogene. You still need telomere maintenance because we also see some patients that even have more than one pathway affected, very good survival. This 
is survival data here. Um, and uh, they all show these mutations, but still survival is very good. And um, this is showing the survival in the total cohort. So again, in blue, this is the total cohort on the right-hand side. No telomere maintenance, no matter whether they show mutations or not. 100% survival. And this is not a tiny subgroup. We have 99 patients, all stages, all ages. These are non-high risk because we don't see any mechanism of telomere maintenance. And um, the red curves are these patients on the left-hand side. So um, if we see telomere maintenance, survival is poor. And it's even devastating if we see mutations in one of these genes that we analyzed. So and this is a very strong marker. I mean, compared to common clinical markers, you see uh, that telomere maintenance as a combination of uh, telomerase dependent and ALT uh, telomere maintenance is uh, uh, a very strong marker, but also these mutations with this panel of 17 genes. So, um, but I have to add that we don't claim that this list of 17 genes is complete. You can add your favorite gene, <laughs> but um, still there are some more genes in these pathways, but we had to start somewhere. So we think this is a just a good starting point. And this is why we uh, just suggest this black and white model. Well, actually it's a green and red model. <laughs> um, um, if you don't see telomere maintenance, any kind of telomere maintenance, um, um, telomerase activation or ALT, this is a non-high risk tumor. And if you see telomere maintenance activation, then you have a high risk tumor. And if you then see any affected genes in one of these two pathways, it's a very high risk tumor. So, and, um, but uh, to summarize and to put this into words, I put this into uh, three categories. Because um, to start with, as I just said, if you see activation of telomere maintenance, you have high-risk neuroblastomas. If you don't see this, it's a low-risk tumor. It's that easy. <laughs> and um, second, as I just said, it's not sufficient to have activated uh, pathways, or if you are to have mutations in these two pathways alone, you need telomere maintenance on top of that to have aggressive tumor growth. And so um, we really see that therapies don't work if you uh, see mutations in these 17 genes. And uh, to summarize, we really think this is, this is a molecular basis uh, for personalized medicine. And we see that therapies don't work, so we need some new, um, new approaches, new therapy approaches. And um, this is why I added this data. So, um, uh, just, just as a background, if you want to inhibit telomere maintenance, again, you have to split it up into the different mechanisms to decide whether you want to inhibit the telomerase as an enzyme or the alternative lengthening of the mechanism uh, of, the, of the telomeres. So this is showing data um, overall survival in orange for ALT and in purple for um, telomerase dependent um, telomere maintenance. And you can see here um, that uh, if you just take a look at uh, telomerase, this is already a very strong marker. ALT alone isn't, but we really think um, if we increase the numbers in these cohorts, we will have better statistics here. But I know that this is not easy to be transferred into the clinic because these are many analyses that you have to combine. But I have to point out here that if you just start to look at the telomerase, good, this is a good marker. So you already capture those patients that um, are high risk. And uh, that is, and, um, as you can see, survival is very poor. That is why we started to check inhibitors um, in the cell culture um, for the inhibition of the telomerase enzyme. And you um, 
So I want to go back. Um, so there are different approaches to uh, inhibit an enzyme. For example, imitel start is an antisense construct that uh, goes to the um, enzymatic pocket of the enzyme and binds in a competitive manner. And cosinolide is a a natural product isolated from plants, which reduces the expression level of telomerase. 6-TODG is a nucleoside analog that causes uh, changes in the elongation. And the Böhringer Ingelheim component binds in a non-competitive manner and it causes conformational changes to the enzyme so that it um, dissociates from the DNA. But we didn't include imitel stat here um, in the presentation because um, we are still validating the data, so I will just show you some data of the three others. And this is a preliminary data, so we just combined some, um, some cell lines that were telomerase dependent and some that were uh, ALT dependent and checked single uh, um, substance analysis. And we included etoposide as a positive control and for single point data. So you can see here, oops, you can see here that um, um, we saw the biggest difference in 6-TODG, um, so we just decided to put this into the mouse, and these are cell lines in um, a subcutaneous xenograft analysis in skid mice. We have two third-dependent cell lines where you can clearly see blue is treated with um, 6-TODG, and red is mock treated. So you can clearly see if we have third rearrangements or high expression that the tumors grow um, less fast uh, if you treat the mice. But what was surprising if um, high third expression comes from McN amplification, we didn't, didn't see um, such, a, such a big difference. And we think maybe this is because McN is a transcription factor and um, doing alternative um, things in the tumor. So, and not surprising, ALT, no effect of the inhibitor. And um, so this is very preliminary data. This is checking for synergistic effects. So as I said, we um, also combine 6-TODG with common substances like etoposide, doxo, and with an ALK inhibitor, serotinib. And you can see in red, cells are dead here um, at, the, at the bottom. And um, so actually with high concentrations, and these are the cell lines. But uh, when we checked for synergy, this was kind of surprising. We see good synergy with the uh, um, um, therapeutic agents. Um, as you can see here, red is synergy, blue is antagonism. But when we checked the data for uh, the ALK inhibitor, we didn't see really uh, too much synergy. Maybe we, we have to validate this, but maybe this is because one of the agents is already so potent. If the cells are dead, you cannot really add any synergy. So, um, but this is what we are working at at the moment. And um, so I have to thank many, many people who contributed to the sequencing project. And, uh, but uh, today I also want to point out that the three people um, who are listed here, Andrea Roda Visa, he, she did the uh, in vitro studies, Janina Fischer did the in vivo data, and um, Felix Otto did the combination studies. And I also want to thank the SWET organization for making this conference possible for me. And then thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I have one technical question about, uh, technical question about uh, mutations in the RAS and P53 pathway. Uh, so uh, how do you consider uh, which mutation is the pathogenic, uh, likely pathogenic, or uncertain significance benign, and the, which of these mutations did you consider as relative or not relative? 
Good point. Actually, I forgot. <laughs> Usually, I, I add this information. So we took the very low-hanging fruit and just considered those uh, mutations relevant that were published in COSMIC, so published in other cancers. We did not include any SNVs, any unknown uh, variants or something. This is really just going to the database, checking whether this is a hotspot mutation or not. So these are really Really, um, commonly known hotspot mutations like RAS position 12, 13, 61 or just amplifications of kinases and, and complete loss of tumor suppressor genes. So we didn't check any, uh, any variants. So very low hanging fruit. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Leave, please. Shout. I, I, don't, I don't shout names. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Is there any idea about heterogeneity in the tumors? Uh, because um, for some tumors you find some telomerase um, uh, activity or aberration. Yeah, I have. There are also some that do not do well, but well, are negative. But maybe we need to biopsy more. Or yes, we have. Uh, we are working on this, and I have some new information on this. So um, we really think that um, this is not really um, um, uh, due to. Uh, uh, yeah, how do you say that? I mean, this is not really uh, d due to dramatic heterogeneity that you need t different tumor biopsies or something. Um, this is more or less, f f even coming from the published data. This is even more or less um, a problem of defining the cutoff for ALT. So if we, ch if we check normal tissue, like muscle tissue or skin or something, you also see some, some signs that you would interpret as ALT positive maybe sometimes, because um, it's, everybody has his, his or her own definition of ALT positive or negative results. That's why we try to add one more layer, because we just did PML body staining. We will add C-circle analysis and other ALT analysis to have a confirmation of what we, what we are looking at. And, and, but we have some cell lines and we sometimes, but these are outliers, sometimes um, we see uh, these mechanisms in parallel. But I really think most of the overlaps come from um, problems in definition. I, I, we are really not sure where the cutoff is, whether you count one cell that is ALT positive in a, in, in a slide or how many. It's like with MECN, you have to define how many cells you need and really, really think. I mean, you don't really see really clear uh, signals of ALT all over the place combined with uh, um, telomerase activation. It's not uh, active in a dramatic way in parallel. But these overlaps, I mean, this is really it, really ongoing. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating report. But, well, first question. This was a very large cohort of patients. Do they come from GPOS, uh, GPOH trials? What? what from which trials do these patients come? This is our own trial. Right. Therapy trials. Uh, so therapy trials. Yeah. This is the, I'm not a clinician, but this is mainly um, the last uh, NBA uh, uh, 2004. So okay. Thank you. GPOH. Yeah, yeah sorry. Okay. okay, for. Um, <laughs> I'm viewing it from pure clinical point of view. And um, from my point of view, it's a very good instrument to see high-risk patients in uh, standard and low-risk groups. So we can see which patients are high-risk and more than high-risk. But if we look at high-risk groups, the patients which are high-risk by clinical standards, so we can take purely clinical scale like uh, the one by Ladenstein, and these high-risk patients and ultra-high-risk patients they are already there yeah. by genetic means. So, uh, the patients from your cohort, they had different therapies. Also, there is a significant difference between EFS and OS. So, those were probably patients treated at relapse and who still live. 
do you have any insights which therapies may be a bit more effective in those patients who are chemo resistant, who are high risk? So maybe the nituximab maintenance, MIBG, something. Do you have any insights or you have no analysis data? I think there were not so many differences in therapy. So I'm not a clinician and I'm not into this uh, data too much, but I think there were not too many differences in therapy. And the, the, that's a correct point. I totally agree. We need a prospective study and we cannot just um, go without therapy in those patients. I mean, it's interesting to, to look at, but this is always uh, the point that you get if you say you can reduce therapy. But um, it's, it's correct that these patients receive therapy and maybe the outcome is because of the therapy. And, and as a biochemist, this is also um, my point of view, that maybe in some patients, if you see those mutations, um, uh, you have poor outcome because the therapies don't hit the target. But we also see some patients with um, uh, uh, telomere maintenance activations, which have, uh, yeah, which show, uh, so I mean, the curve shows that the survival is not so poor. So maybe these therapies actually find a target and work. But this is a good point. I mean, we need a prospective study, and we cannot just say that these patients don't need therapy because maybe this outcome is, yeah. Uh, uh, in a newly designed Cyopen study, uh, this is one of the things we will be looking at uh, because we will look at uh, telomere maintenance in all uh, 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 patients. And in a new Cyopen study, we will randomize between the German GPH MBO204 arm and the Cyopen arm. Uh, and in the patients that, that do not do well and, and need, uh, so have too, too much uh, disease at high dose, they will go to MIBG therapy. So we will know from the high risk prospective study, we will, we will analyze these data in a prospective way. So we will know in the end, in, in some years, uh, your question. So it's a very good question. Thank you, but uh, one more comment. About this difference in EFS and OS, it could be very different and could be very interesting to analyze what therapies they got at relapse. So what get the difference between EFS and us? Yes. For so as I know, they mostly got uh, dentoximab immune therapies, something, and there may be some discrepancies. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I also have a have an opinion about yeah. this. <laughs> so I I also think that uh, sometimes clinicians talk about good events, you know, and we see many of these good events in the EFS curve in these uh, non high risk patients because it's not relevant to have no telomere maintenance um, at this time point. So the cells can still divide. And sometimes the system collapses if the telomeres get too short. So before that, you see more events. You know, This is just uh, basic biology. And so we, see, we still see tumor growth because the, uh, before the telomeres get too short. So this is, this is maybe something that has to do with these type of good events. This is what we are discussing at the moment. Yeah, and the other hand is that if, if patients have a relapse, uh, we start relapse therapy one, and then they're okay, and then few, we start t t two and three and four. So what we see is if you have an event, and uh, it, it may take three to five years before the child will die, so there is a big difference between EFS and OS, and that's because relapse therapies are quite uh, intense and, and different sorts of therapies. Uh, but in, in the end, I think if you wait long enough, the EFS and OS will come together for most of the patients. Maybe I can add something. If you um, so neuroblastoma doesn't have um, so many problems with the uh, tumor sizes. If you take a look at telomere maintenance in other tumors, like brain tumors, where you don't have any space, there are tumors that don't show telomere maintenance and still those patients die just because the tumor, uh, before the tumor has the opportunity, I would say, to regress. And so this is different in neuroblastoma. You don't, don't see this dramatic difference in other uh, tumors like brain tumors because it causes damage before it can regress. So this is the difference that we see here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I think it's time to go forward. Yes. <laughs>